thank you for this kind introduction, really. So it's always great to be here. Um, yes, so as he said, this is submitted to NIPS now. Um, and this is the, the, the really first uh, ever talk that I give about this. And the slides, of course, I prepared in the last minute. Um, so, uh, excuses for if, if I have any mistakes from. So, it's not really a practice talk. Um, I'm from Technical University of Munich. So, for the people who don't know me, um, I am, well, I'm almost finishing now. Um, so, this is probably the last work of my PhD, by the way. Um, and I have done it um, with uh, Umut from Telecom, Paris Tech. And he is, uh, well, he's a really, really good machine learning guy. Um, and Onur Ekan, also from Siemens, and Slobodan Ilic uh, has been my supervisor for the, for the PhD. Um, right, so it's on archive, you can take it. You just, I will let that slide for two seconds um, for the people to note. Um, cool. So, okay, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, Let's, let's get into the problem that I, I want to talk about, actually. Um, let's have the world map, and we have cities in the world. And I would like to ask any of you to guess the, the, the um, time difference between two cities, right? For the people who are jet lag a lot, like him uh, and me right now, um, that should be a really, really um, interesting question to answer. So I ask you weird questions like, what is the, um, you know, the time difference between Addis and Jakarta? It's like probably not many people have heard of these cities anyway. So you just make a wild guess. You just, you have to guess. 11 hours, really? Okay, cool. Nice, nice, I like that. Okay, so basically, uh, you see, uh, and what is the time difference between Jakarta and Delhi? What do you think? Five, nice, nice. So you see, so all these, what you are making is called the hypothesis, right? Um, you are starting to do proposals for, for the time differences. And then, um, and then we do, imagine that we do this for all the cities in the world. And we collect these wild guesses. And by the way, some of you are really, really wild. And if, for instance, you say something like 2.11 hours, right? You just want to make really crazy. The, the, you know, you want to make life hard for me, for instance. Um, yeah, so, and then the question is, I give you the time in Odessa, right? This is called, uh, because we have to fix one reference point. Otherwise, you can basically shift the time in whole cities. Uh, the same. Not 1730, yes, but I aimed for this. I aimed for this when the talk started, but it's not. Um, and then I ask you, what, what time is it in Cairo? Oh, it's the same? Okay, very, very um, stupid then. Okay, it's pick any city. <laughs> yes, okay, pick any city. Um, you know, so uh, basically what, what, what you do, you, you, the only information you had, you didn't know these cities, you, you, let, let, let's imagine that we did this experiment on Mars, right? You had all these Martian cities. And um, well, it, the only thing you had was some wild guesses between these cities based on some world map. And I didn't tell you the absolute times in none of these cities. And can you tell me with some optimality, what time is it? And also, can you tell me uh, with what confidence are you, are you saying it? So are you very confident? Are you not so confident? So this is called an uncertainty, right? Um, of course, we will do it for another problem. I am, I'm not really interested in measuring times. And this is um, the purpose of this. Is, I think this is clock synchronization is for network scientists and physicists. I am not one of those. Um, so basically, we, the problem we have in computer vision, everywhere coming up, you have this 3D structure, and then you have the images of it. And then you have the camera moving around it. You have multiple measurements. And between each measurement, let's say you have this nice epipolar geometry. You compute some fundamental matrix. You compute a relative pose from it. You estimate the K, you know, whatnot. And you can do it between all the images, right? And once you do this whole thing, um, it just the problem turns exactly to, to the problem you have seen here. And it's called the synchronization problem. But you, this time, you synchronize the pauses rather than, uh, rather than the time. Um, and of course, 
this is nice because you don't need to, you know, compute everything for it. You don't need to go through, um, I don't know, all these things and, and do the hassle of trying to optimize for one of those and so on. So the 3D structure, you don't need to care about. All you care about are the poses. So this is actually an interesting slam initialization, if you want to call it that way. Um, you want to do slam, you want to start from somewhere, you want to do bundle adjustment, but you want your initialization to be very close to the optimum point, such that you just run a couple of iterations of bundle adjustment, and that's it. Right? So, why bother? Is basically these reasons. That's a general problem. That's an initialization of a pose graph optimization. And pose graphs appear everywhere. So if you want to do slam, if you want to do structure from motion, bundle adjustment, any form, you need to do a pose graph optimization. And we want to do it without touching the 3D structure. So I will be describing you an approach that can initialize such optimization problems with some uncertainty estimates. Okay. So I will, I will be able to tell you how confident I am about uh, one of the solutions that I produce. Okay, so um, how many of you exactly know th what that slide means? That gives me an idea about the audience. Yeah, like... State? Are you programming on the <laughs> also? <laughs> nice. Yes. So um, it's a rigid pose. It's half a 3D rigid body um, it moves in space. This describes that. And this is a graph where you, you see it in, in computer science classes in the first place. So uh, we want to uh, optimize a graph where every node encodes a pose. That's called the pose graph. So, little more complicated slide um, is like that. You have many cameras, right? And you had this nice, um, nice opera building in Odessa. You were walking around it, and you were taking images. And you have some pairwise relationships. Of course, you do not have these pairwise relationships between every camera, right? Because simply this camera is not viewing the same same area as this camera, therefore you have no constraints to link them together. Might be. Um, and then, of course, for each camera, you can speak up an absolute pose with respect to this, well, with respect to some reference frame, right? You can, you can take the reference frame as the object or as the corner of this, whatever. But then there is a pose associated, which transforms the camera, right? This is called an absolute pose. Um, just like this. So there's a world frame and there are many, many absolute poses. So we want to find these actually. So these RNTs are exactly what we want to find. And uh, we are given these edges, right? So which are basically the relative pose measurements, which I call MIJ. And it's defined here, right? Any pose is composed of a rigid component and a translation. Right? I'm um, sorry, a rotation component and a translation. Um, right. Um, and of course, now the vertices are the cameras, as you see, and edges are these uh, relative, relative measurements that I can obtain either from, if, if my data is 3D, I can obtain from a 3D registration. If my data is 2D, it's called the relative pose estimation problem. Um, I think Zuzana will talk about maybe certain stuff like this in the, in the next talk. Um, yes, so the, 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 this thing, I wrote it on purpose that it belongs to a special Euclidean group. It means that it, it really is a group. So if you, if you multiply two poses together, it gives you another pose. And if you, if you follow a path, a geodesic path, along, uh, for, for instance, or any path actually, which cycles back to the node itself or the pose itself, um, then you should end up at, this, at, the, at the location where you started. Um, therefore, there is this thing called a cycle consistency constraint which um, is written like this, any pose. So basically, it, it, it tells you that take any uh, of, the, of the cameras, right, and compute the relative pose between them. It should give you the, the um, relative pose here. So the problem is with this graph, because you know, we estimated these pairwise relationships independently, these edges, if I start here, follow this edge, go to this camera location, and then this one, this one, this one, this one, I am not ending at the same place. The graph is inconsistent. 
Um, and this is what we want to fix, exactly. This is what we want to optimize. It's also called a multiple rotation averaging problem, um, but we are doing also for translational components, so it's a multiple pose averaging problem, though that term is not really used, I think. I haven't seen much. Um, right, is that clear so far? Okay. Um, so, you know, some idea what, what, what happens. Actually, this is from one of the slides that I presented last year, here, last year, here. Um, so there is an object, you acquire multiple 3D scans of this object. Of course, if you just put them together in one frame, they look like this. But then you have all these pairwise relationships, and if you run some kind of an optimization algorithm, you can end up with the shape. Um, same for the bunny, of course. Um, or you, you, you go to a factory, and you capture some laser scans of this big energy turbine casing. Um, of course, I said Siemens, right? I have to show something. And um, so basically, you scan it from multiple views, and you get these things. Each view is actually associated with a camera pose, of course, right? You took it, you, you took, moved the camera somewhere, and you took a picture there. But this is a 3D picture in that case. And then the idea is that can you reconstruct the object from this? So there are many methods for this, of course. Um, the uh, one idea would be to let's match all to all, you know, compute these registrations and then write a joint optimization algorithm which optimizes over all the points, uh, the overlaps, and so, so on and so forth. You can do this, but you can also do a better thing. You can start with this initialization algorithm that I will describe and then end up, um, end up at a closer minimum and then optimize from that your um, points and whatnot. Okay, this is it. So I will start. So it is the approach we did is unfortunately a little bit technically involved. And I cannot explain all the components, but I will be praising some of the mathematicians which are, which are behind all those ideas, right? So um, especially Hamilton is a British mathematician. Um, and, and Riemann, I think, he has developed one of the greatest theories um, from my perspective. Statisticians might say it's Marco. And this guy actually is, is, is Bingham, is whose distribution we are using, and he's still alive. So it's very nice. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm, not the, I'm not the only one that, that says the, the Riemannian the geometry is, is indeed one of the greatest things ever established. So it's Einstein's comments on it. Uh, these guys, Gauss, Riemann, Ricky, and uh, Levi Civita, I think. Um, I cannot read this. Civita? Okay, Civita. And um, yeah, so he, he was really saying that uh, the magic of this theory will hardly fail to impose itself on anybody who has truly understood it. It represents a genuine tri triumph of the method of absolute differential calculus founded by these guys. So he really used it in his uh, theories to develop the relativity. Right, and it's basically the geometry of curved surfaces. Um, we, I will explain why why um, why it's curved space in a minute. But first, um, let us talk about the curved spaces a little bit. So, um, again, you might not be very familiar with this, but what we want to do is basically um, we we live in an ambient space where we can practically move anywhere, right? But if if I were to put an ant on a sphere and constrain the ant to only move uh, on this sphere, his space would be different. He would be living in a sub-manifold of the, of the 3D space. And the, the, the poses, actually, they are living in sub-manifolds of, uh, of certain spaces, of certain ambient spaces. So basically, instead of you know, taking a shortest path in the Euclidean sense, where we just go along a straight line, we cannot do that anymore, because the ant has to walk on the sphere along a geodesic. And this is the geometry we want to characterize. You can always parameterize the sphere um, in terms of uh, some Euclidean coordinates and whatsoever, um, but this wouldn't be very smooth. That is the problem. So smoothness gives rise to such a geometry. And, and it, it describes one way um, to actually deal with such things in, in, a, in a principled manner. Right. So all you need to do, well, supposedly, is to define an inner product. Right. If you define your inner product in a nice way, you will achieve it. So if I define my inner product to be dx squared, well, a, time st a step in the x direction, a step in the y direction, then I end up with the uh, Euclidean space. Um, if I define other things, I end up in other spaces, which can be curved indeed. Um, of course, once, so the geometry is defined locally. 
Locally means that if I'm at a point x on that sphere, I can speak of a tangent plane. A manifold is a, is, is a, is a, is a, a mathematical topological object that resembles locally a Euclidean space. Right? So I can always speak about a tangent space, and I can always uh, speak of the mappings between the tangent space and the sphere and back. Generally, these are called retractions if you map from the um, tangent space to the sphere, and there are many ways to define them. Um, exponential map is one of them. Um, and it's, 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 the, it's the most, let's say, it, it's, the, it's a correct one, let's say it like this. There are many. Right, so, um, exactly. Uh, and you can define all these things um, for any Riemannian manifold. And you can speak of the length of a path you, where you just sum the directional derivatives along the uh, geodesic connected, the, connecting the two uh, points, x and y. And, of course, the geodesic is a length-minimizing uh, thing. Um, and the length of that can be written in terms of the remaining inner product, like this. Right, so this is a geometry that just, um, you know, gives you, gives you a nice way of dealing with things. And the, the rotations, um, we will parameterize what so-called Hamilton's quaternions. Um, these quaternions are... Um, well, um, they live they live on on some Riemannian manifolds. That's why it's important to know them. Uh, basically, any rotation it's a rotation parameterization, as I try to write here. Um, well, it's a complex number. It's a four-component complex number with a scalar and a vectoral component. Um, the norm of it is one, which means that it, it's on a unit unit sphere always. So its norm cannot be anything else. It's antipodally symmetric, which means that this equality is, is really ambiguous, actually. So it's, the Q is not equal to minus Q, of course. Um, but what is it, it's equal in the sense that what they represent. They represent the same rotation, um, right? And you can rotate a point, Q, P, P, sorry, uh, by a quaternion Q, like this. But this is also a very, uh, let's say, rough and abused notation in the sense that this P um, should be also purified in terms of a quaternion. But anyways. It's a simple operation to rotate points with quaternions. Um, and if you want to have a geometric interpretation of what that is, think of an axis angle. You have an axis and an angle around. Well, you rotate about this axis with an angle. If you write it like this way, so uh, the, the, the axis goes here, multiplied by sine theta by 2, and plus the cosinus theta by 2, you, you get a quaternion. That's it. Um, right. And of course, um, they have they, 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 they form an algebra. They, they, you can do operations on it. So, for instance, you can speak of the conjugate, which in, in that sense is an inverse, um, right? So it's a, of course you have to normalize it, um, and then you can speak of a product of these quaternions. Notation-wise, these these are equivalent for me. Generally, they are not for other people. Um, so you can write it this way. You, you see, it's a simple dot product, cross product. What not? And you can always compute a relative rotation, just just like we computed here, on the pos on the poses, on the rigid poses. We take one, invert the other one, and multiply, and say that this is the relative pose. We can always uh, do that on the quaternions too, given the product is now a quaternion product and the inverse is a quaternion inverse. Okay, so. They have interesting properties, let's say. Um, one of them is that they are, um, they, their manifold is, well, this 4D thing. Actually, it's a 3D, it's, it's S3, so it's a three dimensional spherical object uh, living in this four dimensional ambient space. Um, is, you can, is this manifold is parallelizable. What that means, it means a lot of things, but in that context, what it means is let's say like this, if you, if you were to take in 2D space any vector x, y, right? This is a vector, think of it like this, x and y. And then if I were to tell you how would you compute the thing that is perpendicular to this, what would you do? With what? So if I give you a 2D vector and I, I tell you to find the vector which is orthogonal to it, what do you do? Right. Yes, you would do minus y x, right? Um, so you can't do that because it's a parallelizable manifold, and you can do the same thing in 4D for quaternions. And in fact, you can write it in such a matrix form 
and you realize that all the all these things when multiplied together, the dot product is zero, which means the vectors are orthogonal, right? So it's a nice nice thing. And because of the manifold structure, you can always define geodesics analytically and uh, compute some Riemannian measures on it. And actually, in this sense the, of the rotations, the Riemannian metric corresponds to such a distance between quaternions. So it's a really nice distance. And you can have an analytically computable geodesic. So you can start at a path and walk. OK. Um, any questions on those? Nice. Oh. Yes. So um, now comes a, something called Bingham distribution. Um, it's actually a distribution, antipodally symmetric distribution on the sphere. So you can put the relationship between the quaternions and this now. It, it just defines a, a, a nice distribution for quaternions, really. Right? Um, so what it does, it think of this like a Gaussian. And then instead of the covariance matrix, you put here this, um, this eigen decomposition of the covariance matrix, maybe. And things here are called concentration matrices and so on now. Um, it's, it's really like that. So the V is, a, is, is in that sense, a 4 by 4 orthogonal matrix. This, this is like the variances. Um, and this, this distribution is really like that. So think of it as a heat map, which is symmetric on the sphere. Right? I have a point here. I have a distribution. It just vanishes like this. And also on the other side, like this. And each distribution kind of has a, has a distance, right, um, it, it, in itself. So you can always take a distance and write a distribution by, exponent, by raising it to the exponent. So we, in that case, the distance of the, of, of the Bingham is related to the Riemann by this operation. It's strange, but they are somehow related. Though if minimizing the Bingham distance doesn't correspond to minimizing the Riemannian distance, but they are close enough. Um, so the mean is always zero. That's interesting, because it's symmetric, right? If you take the mean, it will always end up. You know, you will just take the components from two other other sides. Therefore, you always speak of the mod. So the distribution is anchored at a point on the sphere, and then there's a covariance formula, which we will not use, but it's computable like this. Okay, um, a lot of stuff uh, maybe, but um, you also know Monte Carlo. Um, it's just um, if you want to estimate uh, something without really knowing, let's say, its statistical properties, um, what you do is basically you take shots at it. Um, so to estimate the, the, the pi, for instance, in that case, you just make, make a sphere and a, and a square and just throw points here and track, keep track of the points which are falling inside the circle and then, and then outside the circle, and then you compute the uh, pi by the... Uh, you know, simple measures on it. So, um, this is this is generally you can do it for anything. Anything that you you don't know, you basically hypothesize something. You propose something. So, Markov chain Monte Carlo MCMC methods it extends this notion to a Markov chain. So you do this in a chain, a longer chain, and they show that this chain converges to to you, you know, um, the chain basically helps you to estimate a posterior probability. So. Um, you basically propose a move with certain probability and then accept or reject this move. And if you do it long enough along a, uh, along a sequence, that gives, you, um, that gives you nice proposals and nice uh, convergence properties. So uh, to make Monte Markov chain Monte Carlo practically work, you need good proposals. And there are tons of words, works on it. Um, for instance, here you can see something like this. There is a, wherever is red or, or brighter, it means that the distribution is more con concentrated to this area. So it's a Rosenbrock function. And then um, think of the samples that you, that you pick. These, these samples, in the end, they concentrate more in the area where you have higher probability and less in the areas where you have lower, right? So that, that helps you to estimate a probability distribution, actually. Um, and then there is something called the uh, I oh okay sorry um, yes so basically so something called the ha Hamiltonian Monte Carlo it basically says that um, okay um, we can sample things 
uh, but instead of going blindly, we will insert a step in between. We will call it Hamiltonian dynamics, and we will simulate these dynamics for a while, and then decide on acceptance and rejectance. So basically, it's something like this. You take a ball, you have your energy landscape, you throw the ball in the landscape, and the ball kind of lands somewhere and shakes there a little bit, and then from time to time, you kick the ball, and you the ball goes somewhere else, and uh, you know, so, so you navigate this landscape that way. If you want to find the minimum of a function, you just let the ball roll, and then the, it lands somewhere. It can be a local minimum. It samples these parts densely because it, it fluctuates, it oscillates there. And then from time to time, there is this random walk kick, which brings it to other uh, locations of the, of the landscape. This is described in terms of a potential energy and kinetic energy, of course. It's called the Hamiltonian. Cannot go into the details. It's a remarkable thing, actually. Um, there are very nice properties. It's time reversible, so you can reverse back in time. Um, preserves volumes. Um, the, it results in symplectic integrators, which I won't really describe. And then uh, the Hamiltonian is preserved all along, right? It's just the energy preservation, I mean. Um, so, sorry. OK. What we want to do now, so give, this is all, all the, the, the prior work, so this is all what we will base on. What we want to do, we, want, we have a quaternion, which is Qij, right? Which is, which is on the sphere, and the sphere has an has a, um, associated Bingham distribution. And we have another thing which comes from the relative poses, right? And that is also another um, quaternion on the sphere. Let's say I bring these quaternions in the same point. Now, there is a discrepancy between those. So what we want to do, we want to close this discrepancy, right? And therefore, we somehow do more generative approach, where we take, uh, we, we basically try to align the mode of the distribution with the data we have. Um, so uh, it, it can be written something like this. But, uh, but more, what this equation tells you, um, construct a Bingham distribution on the relative pose and let the, the, the mod of this, so the, that, right, be, the, be, the, uh, be your relative pose, basically. Sorry, so the, um, yeah. Um, so let the, this, let the mod of this distribution that, that you have uh, be the, mode of the uh, distribution you have here. And you can do the same thing with the translations. The translations are coupled with rotations because, well, simply because if you invert it um, as you compute the relative pose, they will be coupled with the rotations. So the formula couples it. So the problem is, now we have to construct a V. If you remember, the, the Bingham has a, has a V here and it's four by four matrix on the mod. So, so the, the first column of this is the mod. I know the first column, I know where it's gonna be, but I don't know the rest. And the rest is basically, I know that V is an orthogonal, orthogonal um, matrix. So if, if I give you one co column of the orthogonal matrix, and if I ask you to generate the rest of the columns, what would you do? Any ideas? Yeah. Exactly, it's Gram-Schmidt. You would do Gram-Schmidt. And you know how messy Gram-Schmidt is? Did you ever try to compute the derivatives of a Gram-Schmidt process? It's insane. Um, so, but we are working on quaternions, right? And I just told you that the quaternions enjoy this nice property that if you assemble um, such a form, you will see that the, the columns are orthogonal to each other, just like you would do with the xy. So that gives you all the, all the necessary things to actually uh, do that operation and then take the gradient of it nicely. Because it's also numerically very stable. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so you have some generative distribution. I guess it's a big distribution. But my question is this. Um, let's say you're taking modes on this thing, on this sphere. Uh, but your, where is your measurement noise? And how is that? Because if you're if you're operating, for example, on these quad, on this sphere, mm -hmm. and you're taking modes there, your measurement noise is actually in the image. So I don't in see the, how the in the uh, image, right? You, don't you have some measurements or features that you initially nope. estimate your rotations from? 
Yes. But so, so that should be propagated somehow to the sphere. We don't. Uh, we don't. You can do it, yes. I agree, uh, but we don't do that. This is just the modeling of the, of the problem we have, which is optimizing over the post graph. That's all. This we need because in the end we will compute uncertainties of how good this, how confident I am about this uh, result. That's why we need the probabilistic framework. Um, so you're just using the sphere to... Um to basically average rotations, is, it seems Kind of. To. So what is, what, is the, what is the distribution? So you have this Bingham distribution. So this is a Bingham distribution you're showing. Right. OK, so how is it parameterized? And what do those mean in terms of, of the problem? Because I see how you might have some frequency of rotations on this sphere. But what is it representing then? So, so they, 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 you're collecting rotations on the sphere, I presume, right? This is this is the mm -hmm. this is the likelihood. Um, of no. So, you can look at it from a rotation averaging perspective, but we are not explicitly writing this. What we are instead writing is that um, we want to align uh, the two things, right? Mm -hmm. So that basically the relative pose that I have in the data with the relative pose that I estimate, and. To bring them together, basically we align one distribution, the, the mode of one distribution on top of the other. Well, I, I, I can see, I, I understand that part, but I guess I don't see exactly how... Okay, we'll, we'll talk afterwards about the distribution. Okay, later. maybe I didn't get the question right. Okay. Well, let's, let's, let's yeah, move on. Okay, now. sure, sure. Cool. Um, so, all of, with all of this, so basically we model the quaternions with uh, now um, Bingham, translations with Gaussians, and all these things, which I kind of explained, right? It's, it's, well, this takes, such a, this takes a similar form. Um, so we can write a maximum a posteriori estimate. So we want to find the Q and the T, which are the absolute poses, um, given our likelihood function, plus a prior. For this, we actually left the prior to be uniform because we, we don't actually know how to put a prior there. You can put things, but really we, what we tried didn't work that good, so it just stays uniform. Um, and then the second thing that we want to solve for, we want to estimate the posterior distribution. So we want to optimize this and also sample the posterior. So we need a framework which can do both because if we cannot do this, we cannot estimate uncertainties. If we cannot do this, we cannot optimize. If we go fully Bayesian, fully Monte Carlo, I will end up with this. But it, it wouldn't tell me that the function is minimized at this point. It would just give me that the sample is kind of clustered around there. Um, so we, we want to do two things together. And the way to do this is, and also, by the way, don't forget that now our energy landscape is on a Riemannian manifold, right? So we want to do this, and we want to do this on a manifold. We don't want this. Want the, when, when optimizing this function or generating samples, Q to throw outside the sphere, basically. Um, yeah, so we, we will try to bridge this gap between optimization and, and sampling. Um, so in the recent literature, actually 2016 NIPS, there's a paper called SGMCMC, so um, Stochastic Geodesic MCMC, or, or Stochastic Gradient Geodesic MCMC, I think it was called, um, yeah, here. Um, so they actually kind of do that. They, they do that by rewriting M MCMC sampling. Um, well, first of all, they, 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 so what they do is they, they do not optimize, but but they instead sample. So they sample, they, they run a MCMC simulation on a manifold. And they do this by altering the Hamiltonian. I won't tell you how, but the Riemannian metric just injects into the Hamiltonian, basically. And it's kind of related to the mass matrix that you have before, if for the people that, that, that are knowledgeable about this. Um, right, so this is, this is the key. We take this framework, but then this doesn't optimize. So what we do is basically we show in the paper by injecting a bet, bet, beta parameter into this Hamiltonian, we come up with something which provably optimizes and provably generates samples um, by changing this beta. So think of it as a knob 
if I if I play with beta, I will I will switch from sampling to optimization, optimization to sampling. And in fact, if beta is set to one, Hamiltonian becomes just like that. We recover the um, we recover the SGMCMC, and then if beta goes to infinity, we start doing gradient descent with momentum because the momentum is in those equations with the Hamiltonian equations. Right. So sorry, cannot get into this, but we can talk about it. Um, and then to to do this, to solve this, um, you know, if you do all of these things and follow the standard things, you end up with such a differential equation, which is scary uh, at some point. So there is momentum, there is the Riemannian metric, there are some friction terms, there is this beta, which is, which we call the inverse temperature. Um, it it tampers the energy basically. So. Um, and then there is this Brownian motion, of course. So basically the idea is, is if you set the Brownian motion to be zero, this differential equation can be solved, can be simulated, it finds an optimum. If you set, if you relax this and if you, if you allow for some Brownian motion, then you start navigating this energy landscape. That is the idea. Right, and all happens on the manifold. So, and then uh, what we do is basically this is also a very standard operation. We split this uh, stochastic differential equation because it's not solvable this way, analytically at least. And uh, so you can split it to A, B, O terms. Um, this is also standard thing. Mm -hmm. Sorry. How do you interpret the Hamiltonian path? Yes, to do that uh, routines, mm. you should interpret that uh, part in Hamiltonian, yes, so which is not uh, potential. On yes, so the ha this Hamiltonian path that? actually converges. So normally, if you do Hamiltonian MCMC, it converges to a, uh, uh, to a measure with density, which is e to the minus u. No, I, mean, I mean on previous slide, so, huh? so what does what that work? Hmm? What is Hamiltonian? Yes, that's t plus u. That is, this uh, is potential o, o energy. T, uh, this is right and which is that? How, how hmm? to interpret that during the routines? So what Hamiltonian does is is basically if let's say you have a posterior, right? You flip the posterior, you take the log, you flip the posterior really, so such that it becomes a a, a thing you can fall from, right? And. Uh, it's exactly what it's doing, actually. It, it is, it is, it, you might even define it as the minus log um, posterior. That is kind of the Hamiltonian. I mean, I'm not really explaining all the details here. I'm omitting a lot of stuff. Probably I'll ask this question afterwards. You can, yes, problem. we can discuss. Okay. I mean, it's a huge thing if I really get into the details, yeah, everyone. I, I know what to do. It's if, already if boring. If there is step plus, plus step plus, plus something, I don't know. Sorry? What, I know what to do if there is step plus who, I don't know what to do if there is something plus something else. So you mean this? What, yeah. So it only comes from because you are in the Riemannian manifold. Okay, sorry, so let's talk afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> um, right, so we cannot, as I was saying, we cannot really simulate this, um, but what we can sim simulate is parts of it. If, I, if we just do an A, B, O steps, we can simulate A, B, O individually. And from that, um, there are analytical solutions to this for rotations and translations. And you see how simple that is actually. It's just some, some walk on the geodesic, some uh, friction term update, and then some uh, gradient update and so on. Um, that's, that's more or less it. And you do it for the rotations and translations, right? Um, and then, uh, in the paper, we prove something. We prove that this converges to the global optimum first, but unfortunately it converges to the global optimum with an exponential time. So you really need a lot of time. It's called the metastability phenomenon in this literature of MCMC methods. Um, but eventually we will provide samples close to the global minimum, even for non-convex functions. Right? At least you have, you have this bound, you have this guarantee. It doesn't happen in practice, really. Um, right. And the whole algorithm is just like this. So you compute your gradient, update the rotations in B or A steps, and then uh, run the B or A steps, really, in this order um, for the translations, and you iterate. And depending on how you set beta in this, you can suddenly 
start sampling in the middle or at the end or wherever you want. And that just gives you a nice framework to kind of deal with this, actually. Um, so one thing I didn't mention is that these BOA steps in the simulation literature corresponds to certain integrators, actually. And if you, for example, if you do A, B, O, B, A, or something like that, it corresponds to one particular integrator. If you do B, O, A, B, B, A, B, O, B, something like that, it's another thing. So all these things are actually very, very connected. Um, right. Oof, finally, that's it. Um, that's all the method. If you, if you do it, because uh, now, now we are generating both samples uh, whenever we want and both the solution to the optimization problem. And I can show you some results. We, we apply this to SFM. Uh, these results are not that boring. Um, so first of all, of course, we, we compare with all the other methods. It really doesn't perform that better in terms of optimization. Um, this is primarily because the BOA scheme that we employ is a first order integrator. You can try complicated ones to, if you really want to be accurate. But what we want to be is not, not accurate. We just want to be on par with them. I mean, this result is, is, is better than all of those, but actually we were tuning parameters. If you don't tune, it's just the same. Um, so, and these are all the state-of-the-art methods, by the way. And th this is the mean rotation error, mean translation error individually for all sequences of SFM. Um, right. So. Um, what we want to do, as I said, is not, this is not an important result. I mean, we have this, we can optimize for it. This is, this is what, what it only shows. Um, but what is important is now we can come up with uncertainties. And to do that, we do the following. We optimize until the point where we are satisfied. We are satisfied with the convergence. So we go to the minimum of this landscape and then change beta to a sampling parameter to, to, to do some sampling. And then it just, you know, walks around that. Um, so, and it generates samples. And then you can see that, so, from this data set, um, actually all the images were, were taken of this statue. Not the, not the entire area, but everyone was, was photographing the statue. And then um, you see that the statue is actually white, but all the other areas, which is around it, has high uncertainty. Um, how we transfer the uncertainty from poses, which this, this I didn't tell, transfer the po on the poses, um, to the points is as follows. Um, you, we can, what we can do is we sample this. Each sample we generate is a solution to this problem, right? And then we generate a lot of samples like this, actually 40. And then for each 40 of them, we run a bundle adjustment for the points. So basically triangulate the space. And then uh, e for each solution, the, the point location changes, obviously. And this change, um, well, you can fit a Gaussian to this change and get the standard deviation, right? Uh, do I use yes. this? Okay. So um, and, and so so now now you're this is this is so what I was suggesting was that I, I don't see what this uncertainty means because mm -hmm. really the uncertainty in the beginning is in the measurement space which is the image right. and now now you're propagating uncertainty somehow into this point cloud which was from from very strange yes. manifold where you've averaged rotations and so forth and I just don't see it so uh, maybe you, so um, this is not uh, what we estimate. This is the only way we can show that the estimates are meaningful. So basically, think of it like this. When, when they want to quantify uncertainty for deep networks, for instance, um, they, what they do is they take 10 networks, they pass it through 10 networks, and that actually does a Monte Carlo sampling of the, of the solutions, right, of the regressions. And then they take all these things, and then uh, each one is, is basically a, a whatever parameter that they regress or let's say a classification. And then uh, they, they fit a distribution on this and they say, they say that this is the uncertainty. In general, uncertainty is something like this. So you, you generate samples from the posterior and those samples, of course, describe discreetly the probability space and you do something with that. Um, and what we do here, what we can of course 
color the camera itself, but it is not that meaningful to just color the camera and you know how uncertain the cameras are. We just do it to show that this uncertainty is somewhat meaningful. Because what, what you're seeing here is a standard de deviation over different samplings of the posterior space. So I understand that. Uh, my question, though, is like, so you, you are doing these calculations on a manifold, right? Right. This, so, so now you're doing statistics on a manifold, uh, which that you have some concept of standard deviation and mean on this, in this manifold space. Uh, and, and that's, so somehow, it's a, my only point is it's a very strange space to, to be doing these statistical calculations. So Why do you think it's strange, by the way? It's just a Cartesian product of uh, SO3 and the R3, really. Okay, well, we can discuss it afterwards. But, but okay. I, I, was, my, my, I was just, it's not easily interpretable what these uncertainties are in this space. Exactly, but it's very hard in general to interpret uncertainties. That's why we show these things. I mean, it's, it's the only way that I can, I can really quantify it, by sampling. Um, more results? So here, wherever we have more vegetation, we, we have more uncertainty. And um, in this, this example is interesting, actually. If you do the same thing um, to this reconstruction, what happens is that the close-by components are blue, then the distance components are, are more red. Um, yes, and I will just show you one thing. So let me start again. So we start from a random initialization. Oh, OK. Yeah. Sorry. So now we start from a random initialization, because, you know, because we can theoretically converge from anywhere, right? Um, so we start from this random thing. And you see the evolution of the pose graph as the solutions iterate. is doing this weird thing, which is hard to probably speak about. I mean, the only interesting thing is this guy is staying away because probably there is no purpose in, in bringing this guy back for a long while. Um, and then it comes back. Um, and then there is another. Yeah, so this is a temple object reconstructed this way. And this is, the, this is another one. So it again starts from this random, Gaussian random initialization of the SE3. This one is slower because we have more, well, we plotted basically every single iteration. Yeah. So, but, of course, we have the, oh, yes, so it, is, it goes like this, as you have seen, but we have the ground truth for this, right? So the ground truth is basically, you do a full bundle adjustment. And so all these bundle adjustments that we were doing, by the way, we didn't touch the poses. The poses were obtained from our measurements. We only adjusted the structure. The ground truth would be adjusting both the poses and structure at the same time. This probably gives you a much better result. Um, and this is the, what we call the bundle adjusted pose graph, basically. And this is how you compare. It's pretty close, actually. You can recover very nice pose graphs from that. OK, done. Thank you. We have time for questions, like yes. 20 minutes, and uh, yeah, I'm back from. Uh, yeah, so, so thank you for your talk. Actually, for, for me, as having background in physics, it's a pleasure uh, oh, kind cool. of uh, formulations. And uh, the question is, uh, so I missed a bit, uh, explicit formulation of your optimization task. So I have seen that there, but could you please explain each term and what does it mean in terms uh, like uh, we want to find poses which minimizes some distances between something. Could you please 
explain what does mm -hmm. it mean term by term um, in sure. your formulation? So, yes, you can think of it that way. Um, basically, you can think of this energy as a data term and a regularization term. Right? Forget about the regularizers. Um, yeah, you, I, I mean, which term means what? Yes, so here, this one, right? So given one solution, the likelihood of, of generating the data, so it's a generative model, right? Given one solution, the likelihood of generating translations, sorry, this is for rotations, this is for translations, and and this is how, so the trans, well, actually yes, so the, um, we model all the, tra so translations are coupled with rotations in general. Is that clear? I can also explain this if not. Uh, what, what you said is clear, so maybe a step back then, mm -hmm. uh, we, I need a step back uh, to, to understand uh, how, how, how which, which distributions are taken because, right, so uh, whenever because, you see rotation... Th th that means some uh, actually distances. Right, it right? does. Mm -hmm. uh, some distances between uh, right. actual poses. So what distance is minimized? Are you concerned yeah, about yeah, this? That's, yes, that's the question. Yes, okay. Um, this distance is minimized. So um, it's a Bingham distribution, right? It has some distance, of course, e to the distance. And that distance, so this is the geodesic distance on the Riemannian manifold. Any, 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 you take two rotations, you compute the geodesic, there's a solution for this, um, for that special case of the special orthogonal group has a solution, which is that. I mean, in general, Riemannian distances are in, of that form, if not something abrupt. Um, and then, if you, if you just plug Cotern, convert this to Coternians and do the same thing, it, it is... Yeah, this, this, this is clear, okay. I, I, this I is clear. I'm too slow-minded for, for, for understanding this, this right now. I think I would ask it uh, afterwards. You can, that, but that, that's absolutely clear. the only thing I'm saying is this, you can think of yeah, this, this Bingham this, distance yeah, as the divide this by two, take the cosine and square it. Okay, that's, that's clear. That okay. is the distance. I will try to rephrase the question in, in, okay. in some personal talk. Well, so actually, this, this distance between the relative poses uh, computed and, uh, and the data is mi minimized. That's what is, is being minimized. Okay. More questions? Okay. It's not a question, just a remark. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but this uh, mathematical flow is very similar to um, proof of convergence of Boltzmann machines, yes? Probably. <laughs> yes. Um, so the, in the proof, we particularly con we are concerned with rotations and translations. And if, if only ha we have the rotations, our proof doesn't work actually. We need to have rotations and translations together. Um, and we devise a proof for that problem, um, particularly. Though I know that this kind of thing generalizes. So if you have other problems and if you want to find the convergence guarantees for other things, you can just apply the same way. But it was just for, for us much easier um, to do it this way. I have a question. Um, probably there will be two of them. The first one is, uh, what happens if the pose graph is not right uh, defined? So if it uh, has m uh, some uh, erroneous edges. For example, the connection between two cameras that cannot see the same um, part of the object. Ah, you mean outliers? Yes, it is, it is outliers in the input data. It is, out the, so it is more robust to outliers than the methods I compared with, but there is no handling of the outliers in that. Maybe because of the probabilistic formulation, it is more robust to noise, but not to the outliers. And so you can always add outlier treatment. You can always add robust cost functions or ransack-like sampling yes. of the graph. So you subsample the graph, do a estimation, you again do the same, such that you are, you are getting rid of these outliers. You can do these things, but it's not the purpose of that work. Okay, thank you. More questions? Okay. So, so 
So I, I thought I would just summarize to see if I understand, uh, because so in, in, a, in essence, you're treating the uh, measurements as the rotations and translations that are estimate. These are your measurements, right? Th this is what you're, you've measured. And then yes. you're sampling what you think, for, for the MCMC, you're sampling quaternions and generating translations, I presume. Is this the correct? absolute race, absolute yeah. ones. And these are what you, you hope to, it, to converge to the true value. And you're measuring the likelihood against the measurements that you have on this on this manifold and okay so i i, I get that uh and just out of curiosity so you were talking about convergence time i i think sampling is notoriously slow so how how long is it taking to arrive at a solution for that? that is why we don't do it we set first beta um, to an infinite value such that the brownian motion is set to zero and then you only optimize for a long while and when, when you hit the bottom you tune the beta to 400, 500, the large value, let's say. And then it starts sampling around this local point. There is a slight chance that it will escape from that and find another local minimum. Yet this time is exponential and therefore in practice it's always staying about this local minimum. But the sampling is only made there. So actually uh, it is, I would say, faster than a certain sampling method. Right? because you are not purely sampling it. There is no, let's say it like this, the burn-in rate is less because you are optimizing there. More questions? Oh, it's quite fast if you only optimize because these operations, um, actually you would get from this. Um, these are super simple. That's all you compute per iterate. And it's just per, per, you compute this for all the quaternions, of course, but it's just vector operations, you know, additions and stuff. Like a gradient descent. Like a gradient descent with momentum. I would say, yeah. Maybe slightly slower, but that's, a, that's it. Um, it, it. It solves one um, SFM problem in about a second. Yeah. A C implementation. MATLAB was way slower. More questions? Okay. Bundle adjustment is usually a relative estimate, so basically when you have camera poses, you have to deal with the scale. And from my experience, sometimes when you do bundle adjustment, it just like uh, throws away the scale like far away, like cameras or just make it mm -hmm. really close. How do you keep the scale like intact so with the optimization? So we don't do bundle adjustment, first of all. So the scale is always absolute. Um, the translation fully determines the scale. But for the cases, um, of course, if, if, we are, if we are estimating relative poses uh, individually, um, the, we just, it's, we don't do it in the correct scale, basically. We just do it, all the things scaled to something. So basically, we normalize the T values, and, uh, and everything is always scaled to such a thing. And we solve it there. So you do it in some scale, and then yeah. like, OK. More questions? Maybe Mr. Schlesinger have any, any comments? No? No? In, after that? Okay. Okay. Maybe you have. Um, do you like questions? I like questions. Yeah, yes. no, I mean, like, I previous questions were good? Yes, yes, of course, of yeah? course. Okay, good. Uh, thank you very much. And sure. you can pass, pick up. Um, thank you, thank you. <laughs> and I would say, so whatever you would like to discuss afterwards, I'm, I'm, I'm open. <laughs> yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tolga.